Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for this wonderful uh, conference. I enjoyed it very much. And I hope you have enough energy in you uh, or coffee near you to go through this last talk. Uh, if not, I'll try to just yell so that you can follow me. Uh, I'm, my name is Kabadi Shami. I'm a researcher, a staff scientist, if you wish, uh, at the National Research Council. Um, and because we can't give degrees, we hire students from universities. So I'm affiliated with uh, uh, University of Ottawa and University of Calgary uh, to, to, to be able to attract students. Uh, just to tell a little bit about ourselves, we are also in a building built in 1930s that pretends to be older, <laughs> similar to the lab at Duke. Um, we, for those of you who are old enough, uh, we uh, sort of evolve out of uh, a, a place called Stacey Institute for Molecular Sciences, so mostly based on AMO physics. Uh, so there's a lot of... Um, oh, um, yeah. Okay, learning. Um, so there's a lot of uh, experimental AMO physics going on uh, at, at NRC, uh, 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 auto second science, ultra fast quantum optics. We, it's a group, experimental group. We work with them closely. And there's a theory and computation group, and that's where we live. Um, and within that, there's uh, like a bunch of uh, subgroups, let's say. And uh, like during the pandemic, we decided to form our own subgroup. Since we're fairly fairly young and young, and that's why we have a good group meeting, uh, uh, the, the group photo on Zoom, unfortunately. Um, so we call ourselves Photonic Quantum Information Processing uh, Team, uh, and we traditionally did quantum communications. Now we're doing uh, thanks to uh, Aaron, a wonderful uh, research associate. Uh, you heard us talk earlier at the conference. Uh, we're now doing a bit of quantum metrology as well. Uh, and today I'll tell you about quantum simulation side a little bit. Um, uh, so yeah, we have a, a couple of PhD students, but always a flow of undergraduate students going through the group. And we're growing a little bit. So we are hope to attract uh, one or two more postdocs in, in a few months. So if you're interested, stay in touch, please. Um, okay, it works. Uh, so the title, you might have noticed that it says Rydberg Physics. We talked, we heard wonderful talks about Rydberg atoms, but I, the title is deliberate because I'm going to talk about both Rydberg atoms, which is more familiar, uh, um, but but also uh, Rydberg excitons in semiconductors, and this is less popular, less familiar. And but I hope by the end you get excited about it. Uh, what you see on the left, uh, this is the, the spectrum for cesium vapor. Uh, it gets a lot nicer when you cool it down. And then you can do the, those wonderful experiments, either rubidium or cesium, uh, when you put them in, a, in, in these optical lattices. Um, uh, this, but, but you notice on, on the right, that's a, that's a, a, a semiconductor. It's cuprous oxide. Um, and it also shows a similar behavior. And, and we like typically call these things hydrogen-like series. And the way that this appears is that um, uh, when you have uh, in a, uh, a semiconductor with a high binding energy, which doesn't have, like most people are familiar with gallium arsenide, and uh, uh, which the, uh, the binding energy is around 5 milli electron volt, just to give you a reference. For cuprous oxide, it's 100 milli electron volt. For hydrogen atom, you can, it's, it's in multiple electron volts. So this should give you an idea how well you can sort of distinguish these bound, bound states of, of the, uh, in this case, the, well, in the semiconductor, it's the electron hole pair, uh, that they remain too close to each other enough so that the, 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 the attractive Coulomb interaction is still acting on the, on the state. So they don't go to the conduction band and do their own thing inside the, the semiconductor. So though these states that you, that you see here, these are uh, those bound states that, that are created because of the, uh, the Coulomb interaction between the, the electron and the hole inside the semiconductor. Another interesting comparison is that this binding energy has an impact on the size of the wave function. So if you, if you have an atom, it, it's really small. If you have an electron hole pair with 
only tens of uh, milli electron volt and so binding energy tends to be a really big wave function. So it's hard to see these things if you have any defect in your crystal. Um, another wonderful proper property of Rydberg, which is the same for excitons and atoms, is that when you go high up to these Rydberg levels, uh, the, there is a, a significant overlap between the neighboring uh, sort of, uh, wave functions. And this, if you can always calculate the overlap between these two wave functions and calculate the transition dipole moment for these things. And it tends to scale with uh, n squared. So that's an amazing property, which I'll tell you a little bit later how that leads to, to interesting uh, properties in these, uh, in these systems. The other thing that I haven't shown here is that the lifetime as, of these states goes as uh, uh, n to the three. So they become long lived as we go higher up. Uh, again, another useful property if we want to do some, some quantum application. Uh, like, I really like this slide that I'm so taking it from this uh, uh, book chapter. Um, and it, it, it's a, another way to explain the nature of the interaction when you have two Rydberg atoms near each other. So imagine uh, 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 that you have uh, uh, one atom on this side at the level ns uh, and another atom at, at n minus uh, 1p. That's, they're near each other. There's this virtual de uh, decay that could happen, but it actually doesn't happen in reality. But you can think of this of virtual photon exchange where this one decays to the n minus 1p, gives away a photon, and the other one jumps to the to the uh, NS state. Uh, as, as a result, we go from NS uh, N minus 1P for the two atom state to N minus 1P NS state. Uh, and, and you can see that the, such a interaction will, it, it's one dipole transition, another dipole transition uh, happening at the same time, and it's resonant. So uh, these are identical atoms. Uh, uh, this results in this dipole dipole type interaction. And I told you earlier that each dipole scales as n squared, so the dipole-dipole interaction itself scales as n to the four. So that's one type, but actually the, the more common type of interaction which happens is the standard box. Takes one, like a little bit <laughs> longer to explain, but it's the same, same principle. You, you have your atoms at ns, ns, one of them decays to this near, uh, a state nearby n minus uh, n prime p, and then uh, gives away a photon. It turns out that it's actually off resonant, but it could still create a transition. Uh, that transition doesn't stay uh, forever. So it decay gives away the photon. This one goes back. Everything ends up in the same state in the end. But for, to calculate that type of interaction, uh, just to know how strong it is, I can calculate the number of dipole transitions involved, OK? So I can, so there's one dipole transition, another two, the decay back is three, and then going back up is four. That's four dipole transitions. Uh, and that leads to, uh, the dipole is n, to, uh, n squared, it leads to n to the eight, but you see an, an n to the 11 here, which could be confusing. The reason is that this delta E itself uh, gives you another n to the three. So the whole interaction, the Van, Van der Waals interaction strength could scale as the principal quantum number to the power of 11. Uh, and the distance is, uh, sort of, it, it scales as R to the six, uh, which R would be the distance between the two atoms. So this uh, is what results in all these sort of strong interactions between Rydberg atoms, which results in all these wonderful experiments. Uh, so I'm going to sort of now move to motivate this uh, field a, a bit with applications. And I usually divide it into three areas. Sensing, you could do quantum simulation and computation, which we heard about earlier this week. And there's also, you could do not quantum nonlinear optics. And if I go from right to left, tell you a little bit about this. Uh, they, in this experiment, they send a weak coherent state through the, the, the atomic ensemble. You excite them to the Rydberg level. The Rydberg blockade effect 
doesn't, so a coherent state has a vacuum component, single photon, two photon, and more, but this uh, medium is such that it doesn't let any sort of two photon uh, uh, state to be absorbed, so you can only excite a single photon, uh, or, and it's a, it's a property of that Rydberg interaction. So that results in a nonlinear interaction at the single photon level. That's why I call a quantum nonlinear optics uh, application. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, the, in, uh, in these wonderful experiments, and I'll, I'll talk more about this and how we try to, so we get inspired by this and try to do other things. Uh, and then this really strong transition dipole moment, it, you can think of it, it it's, it's very effective in absorbing micro field when that uh, when it's re in resonance so for that reason it becomes a really good absorber for these things and now there are even companies thinking about so building sense uh, uh, microwave antennas out of Friedberg atoms so yeah those are the applications uh, i'm going to tell you about two things we did recently uh, so one is on the Friedberg exciton size on the right the other one is uh, inspired by these trapped atoms atom experiments, so we'll talk a bit about that too. Um, uh, but the, uh, you can think of these as feasibility studies, <laughs> so they may not be as exciting as the rest of the talks we heard, but hopefully it's interesting enough. Um, um, so in cuprous oxide, uh, people have known cuprous oxide for a very long time. It was a candidate for uh, uh, exciton condensation because of that high binding energy in the condensed matter um, physics field. Uh, for a long time, we knew about these high binding energy and the Rydberg states are there. We haven't observed them because we didn't have good enough spectroscopy techniques, let's say. This uh, wonderful experiment by a group of Manfred Bayer in 2014, they, they scanned uh, really carefully through all these resonances and they went up to uh, N of 25. That's the principal quantum number of 25. And just to, I'm uh, always fascinated by these things where like the size of the wave function, the radius is about one micrometer. So the electron hole pair is spread over you know, about two or a little over one micrometer inside this crystal. So imagine any defect in the crystal could really like mess with the spectrum. But they had this really nice uh, uh, gemstone from a, a mine in Namibia that it was, it was nice and clean enough uh, uh, to, to do this experiment. Uh, unfortunately, in this field, the, the synthetic material is not good enough yet, so people still use uh, gemstones. Uh, so if you know a gem dealer, you can reach out to these uh, <laughs> groups. Um, so you can see this is the spectrum. They did a power scan, uh, and one thing that they could extract was this uh, blockade efficiency. It's not a direct observation of the Rydberg blockade effect, which is, which is what we want, but um, it's uh, uh, when, when you gradually increase the power of your laser that you want to do the spectroscopy with, uh, they, in, instead of, so if it's a linear absorption medium, the, like a ratio, a constant ratio of that light should come out, right, at the other end. But if something nonlinear is happening, uh, or for example, if a blockade effect is happening, it means that when I'm trying to, for example, probe uh, uh, one of these levels, if I increase the intensity and the blockade effect happens, actually the, the transmission goes up because I can't absorb more light in the medium because of the blockade. So the blockade actually rules out the part of the, part of the crystal as an absorber. Uh, so they observed that in this in the, this power dependence in the in this paper, and from that they extracted this blockade efficiency, which is what we want. So we got excited as soon as we saw this. It, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, we heard about the blockade effect. The the way it happens that you can think about so two neighboring atoms, uh, you can shine a laser to it. You can excite either first one or the second one. That's the intermediate state energetically. And then you can try to excite both, but then this, uh, if they're too close to each other, this uh, uh, very strong rydberg rydberg interaction kicks in. And uh, we def usually set this blockade radius as when this uh, shift because of the interaction is the same as the, the, Ra the Rabi frequency of the laser you're trying to probe. 
this is not just a random choice. It's because when you shine a laser like that, you have a power broadening of that, uh, almost that value in your system. So you want the interaction to be at least as big as the power broadening. Yeah, so that's the, the blockade. So we thought uh, one of the like, very first ideas for Rydberg atoms was, can we make a single photon source out of them? So if I shine a laser, which has all the photon distributions, can I get only a single excitation? And therefore, from the emission, can I get a like, nice, so pure single photon out of it? For, so we translated that idea to the excitons. Uh, we used a very simple model, so I don't recommend, actually, if you if you want to go after, I think we are at the stage to do more careful calculations in this space. But at least that really preliminary model gave us um, the rate at which you can excite these things. And, um, and also we took a step further to calculate the G2. So what is the probability of creating a secondary excitation? Because that would affect the purity of your system. But uh, the life, the, the, in the Cooper's oxide, the life, uh, times are of order of a nanosecond, so the, you can drive these systems really fast. Because you, if, if you make a single photon source out of it, it will be a really bright single photon source. So that was uh, a few years back. And then, uh, well, we got really inspired by these uh, impressive uh, Rydberg atom experiments. And the question was, can we do the same thing in, with the Rydberg excitons? Uh, um, Okay, uh, and one, like one of the early experiments where uh, they showed that you can do quantum many body dynamics. In particular, it is this Z2 ordered phase that, that, that they reached in this experiment. Uh, so the question was, can we, can we do the same thing? Can we reach this Z2 ordered phase with uh, the Rydberg excitons? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it's it's a, a bit more messy, unfortunately but we made it work. Uh, the reason is, uh, so let's just talk about the arrangement. We took a slab of uh, like a very thin slab of this cuprous oxide crystal, and we focused multiple lasers. And you notice these are yellow lasers because we're addressing the, the yellow exciton series in these things. I, and it, I'm showing only one, but in reality, we're looking at, into a two photon excitation actually, because the single photon excitation takes you to P states. These are not so nice when you try to look at angle dependent interaction. So we, we're going with the two photon transition to an NS state in Rydberg exciton. Okay. It turns out uh, the, we can't really isolate one level. These uh, Rydberg exciton levels are really close to each other. If I try to excite one, I end up exciting the neighboring states as well. So it's unfortunate because we first went with a two level, nice two level model, and it was perfect because we could recreate the whole sort of the Rydberg atom version of this. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this system is not as nice. Um, but in the end, we managed to e even include these all neighboring states and try to minimize the probability of exciting those by just playing with the, param the laser parameters, which it's, a, it's just a, so that we don't play with the pulse shape, but we play with the, with the detuning. There's a tiny shift in the detuning in the, in the middle of the pulse. Uh, that seems to be useful uh, to optimize, uh, to, to, to get to the desired state. Uh, there are some subtleties like the, the for example, the, the Rabi frequency that you choose to address your desired state because the dipole transition, it changes with N, it's not the same uh, Rabi frequency. So you have to take all these subtleties into account, uh, but we do that. And then uh, uh, we, as I already told you about that, we run the simulation to, uh, for 12, a, a 12 site polygon. And because we're not limited in, in theory to any arrangement, we put them in a polygon instead of putting them in a line. So that gives me a periodic boundary condition. So that's the difference. Otherwise, this is still a linear geometry. Uh, what the nice thing we saw that we, we could optimize uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, control parameters that one would use in the lab to, um, to maximize the probability of 
landing on that desired state. And the desired state for us, it's this RGRG or GRGR, which now probably reminds you of this Z2 ordered state. Um, the, then we have looked at the scaling. Uh, unfortunately, there is an exponential decay in the probability of landing on that state. But it's always, you know, you always get these, these states always become the most probable state at the outcome of your, you know, at the end, the end of your uh, experiment. But the probability goes down with the size of the system. And this was also something that was seen in the experiment uh, uh, with the Rydberg atoms. So we can't do much about that. Um, but I'm going to show you this. So for the Z2 ordered uh, phase, you don't need to actually detect the whole system. You can just look at the, the two side correlation, uh, which you, you, you want to see an anti correlation for every so, uh, uh, near, nearest neighbor site. Uh, and you see this alternation between red and blue, and that's what it tells you. So if I have an excitation in site one, uh, it's anti correlated with site two. And, and this continues. And you see this uh, blob here, and that's because of the periodic boundary condition, because at the other end, so my site number one sees actually site number 12, and they have an anti-correlation between each other. This was nice. This was what we were aiming for, just to see if we take properties from the Rydberg exon. Can we recreate some of those wonderful experiments? Well, this was theory. I shouldn't mislead you. Yeah. Uh, but this is to encourage experiments in that direction. Yeah. Uh, but then the referees, uh, well, we couldn't handle solving and optimizing at the same time for experimental parameters for with the master equation. So what we were solving was like they didn't have any um, dissipation effect in the system. So the optimization was done for like a, a perfect world. Uh, one thing that I just need to highlight is that uh, we shorten the dynamics to a very short period of time so that those dissipation effects have a, like a minimal impact on the, on the system. So we at least had that condition and try to work under that condition, which actually showed that it's useful. So we went and looked at the smaller system that we could handle the master equation and the dissipation effects. And it shows that because we're in this very short sort of pulsed regime, we, we oh, uh, we, um, we don't get a, a very strong effect from the dissipation. So the effect survives, the Z2 ordered phase survives even, uh, and even if you have, deal with, the, uh, with dissipation and decay in your system. The other thing is that atoms are nice because you put them in a trap and you know where they are. Uh, so ground state of an atom is meaningful. Ground state of an exciton doesn't have a position because it's, it's where I, I assume my ground state is that when I, I haven't created the electron hole pair. I could sort of redefine my system, still create the electron hole pair, but choose the ground state to be some state of that. But in this case, we chose the ground state to be the electron hole pair not being created. <laughs> uh, and that means that you don't know where the position is. You have to come up with a description with the position and we, kind of took the laser profile as, as where the, the ground state of the exciton is allowed to be. And that has a, a range, a, a, a spread. So we allowed in, uh, to, to go away from this point-like description, and we are allowing now some movement or uh, uncertainty in the position of the exciton. And again, the effect survives that. So if you... Uh, um, so we did a, like a toy, uh, seven minutes. So we did a, like, again, inspired by the Rydberg atoms, uh, we thought, can we look at a very small scale maximum independent set problem? Because this blockade effect is so, like, it's natural solution to that. So, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so what we did, we took a, a, a graph, uh, that we like to find a maximum independent set of that graph. And then uh, we have to go and find the proper positions for the laser spots on this crystal. Uh, and if you do that and then shine the laser, like some dynamics happens for the, 
the multi sort of this this multi exit on system. Uh, what and then so you have to look at this uh, potential emission from these excitations that you've created. Uh, the solution is um, uh, the maximum independent set problem is from the bright spots, for example, that I get from the, the sample. And because of the blockade effect, the ones that are within the blockade radius don't, both of them don't get excited. It means that the, the outcomes of that, that uh, dynamic has a very low probability of giving me things that are not sort of out in, uh, not inside the independent set. So it usually gives you something inside the independent set. Um, oh. Uh, um, so, and then we looked at the probability of sort of Rydberg uh, excitons being created. Uh, it turns out that uh, you can go as high as five, and that's basically uh, sort of an error in the system. You accidentally, your blockade is not perfect, you accidentally create. So, the solution would be look at the highest number of Rydberg states you created. And that is probably the number of nodes you have in your independent set, which seems to be true in this case because the solution is five. So in this graph, you have five independent nodes. And uh, this suggests that you can only, uh, with a, a reasonable statistics, you can only create as high as five excitations. This, I should warn you, this is not scalable. Uh, this is not going to be a, sort of a, a scalable approach because even finding the position of your laser is, is hard. If you actually want to do this in a scalable way, go and read Sapir's paper, <laughs> because you need this n squared uh, ancillary qubits to map your problem properly onto the Rydberg system. If you just randomly put your laser on a, or atoms in that case in space, that only gives you very specific types of graphs, not any arbitrary uh, problem. Okay, but it was fun to, to do this. <laughs> Uh, just a quick uh, uh, summary of this. So there was a, a major problem, which was these levels were too close. And uh, the, the lifetimes are, are uh, too short. The tails of these levels are overlapping. This created a lot of constraints and now the best solutions we could find. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's very interesting in an entirely different field. Again, condensed matter physics, people are trying to push for two parameters have very high binding energy and uh, a long lifetime. And apparently, if you have these two things, you can get exciton condensation at room temperature, which has been a dream for a long time. Uh, and it, it turns out that there are very smart people in that field, and they're figuring these things out. So that, that gives me hope that I can uh, actually borrow ideas from, from there. And this was one of the sort of early evidences of uh, getting high temperature exciton condensation. The way that this happens is that you take these 2D materials, these both have high binding energy, so they satisfy that condition. And instead of creating an exciton in each layer, you create an exciton, an interlayer exciton. So you like to get, get the electron from one layer and the hole from the other layer. And these uh, uh, sort of interlayer excitons, there's al already an observation for them. The clever thing is that you put some number of HPN, insulator layers in between. And as you move them apart, the, the, the recombination rate uh, becomes slower and slower. So now you have a way to keep the, the, the high binding energy that nature gives you and then engineer the lifetime uh, in an arbitrary way. So that's really nice because I can sort of take that uh, and people already observe Rydberg states of these uh, in, in these uh, materials. So I can put those two together and hopefully uh, make a better system for, for uh, observation of, sort of, or applications of uh, or quantum applications in these Gridberg exciton systems. So there is a way to, to get around that problem. Uh, next part, I'd like to sort of move on to the NICE uh, system, uh, which has already been shown to do a lot of things. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. So we have a, a system of five or six atoms in a trap, and we try to address them in, uh, separately and try to control such that it takes us to a, a state that we like, or we can simulate a circuit that we like. Those are the two targets. So uh, this is our uh, 
path for our thoughts, how we ended up in this project. So QOA, it's already sort of explored for combinatorial problems. That inspired uh, uh, Hesie and his uh, colleague to, to use that approach. It's uh, the same construction that you use in QAOA for state generation. Okay, so that also inspired us. So you take, um, uh, you, you take an initial system of your system, uh, uh, initial state, and then you apply alternatively, you apply your interaction Hamiltonian or non-interacting part of the Hamiltonian, and you alternate between these things. You parameterize it and you try to sort of land on the ground or some eigen, uh, energy eigenstate of your system. So that's the goal. That's what happens in QAOA. You can also use it for state preparation. Uh, it turns out that some nice states are eigen energies of these sort of file, uh, like two local Hamiltonians, um, uh, including the GHZ state and the toric code. But there is a, a limitation. Uh, oh, so first, I like to say that the unit, the, this unitary transformation that you can make out of these sort of single qubit and two local Hamiltonians, it's universal, so you can reach any dynamics that you like. That's nice, uh, uh, and this was shown in this paper by Seth Lloyd. But um, in this paper, uh, there, like this, gives us a limitation because they found there there are states that are far from energy eigenstates of any k local Hamiltonian. So it means that if I only look for energy eigenstates with this like two local or k local Hamiltonians, it, there will be states that I cannot reach. So I don't. So I want to move away from this condition that I want to reach an eigen, energy eigenstate. I like to reach any arbitrary state without worrying about uh, uh, my state being a, an energy eigenstate of a Hamiltonian. That's what we try to do. For that, I just need to change the cost function of my optimization. So instead of going from this being the uh, uh, cl as close as possible to an energy eigenstate of this interacting Hamiltonian, I just look at the fidelity of the this, this state that uh, it, uh, comes out at the end, uh, end of the dynamics with respect to the O being any objective state that I like. So I pick a state and I try to get as close as possible to it. And what to pick, there is GH set state, cluster states, absolutely maximally entangled states, and also why not we, sh we should do circuit simulations as well. It doesn't have to be state preparation. So spoiler alert, we tried all these things, and uh, with at least like to the, at the, at the very first attempt with uh, at least two nines, we can reach all of them, but that's not the interesting part. Um, so yeah, that's the construction. I'm not going to go into it, but it means like we parameterize this thing. This becomes a, a, just an optimization, a very hard search problem. Okay, as hard, uh, and the, the hardness depends on how many times you apply these Hamiltonians to your system. Uh, so every time that I apply that Hamiltonian, I need an, like a ZZ type and, uh, uh, and, uh, and like also ZZ type for the next site, or let's say this would be for the even site for the, uh, odd sites, and then I have single qubit operations as well. Okay, so that's the construction, and then all these alpha, beta, and gamma parameters are unknown. It means that when I turn on and off these Hamiltonians, uh, it, I don't know for how long I would like could keep them. So I ask my optimization problem to go and find the best combination of those parameters, such that it gives me the the, the a state as close as what I wanted. Um, and the, the only thing we need to simulate a circuit is that we, we can just change the, the cost function and look at the, the fidelity for the, how close we can get to a unitary. Uh, and we could, we, 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 we started looking into that. Uh, so what I showed was abstract, but there is a Rydberg atom implementation for it. We know how to these, to the, do these single atom and two qubit operations. Uh, with either a single uh, application of a pulse or, or three pulses. So it's as simple as that. Uh, so we looked at the cluster state, uh, a five qubit fully connected cluster state, but it's just to remind you the physical system is in a linear geometry and the, the, the Hamiltonian or the interaction Hamiltonian is too local. So they don't necessarily see each other directly, uh, but the, this optimization problem doesn't care. You just ask to get as close as possible to that state 
And this is the one minus fidelity. So you can go at as, as low as, let's say, uh, 10, even lower than 10 to the negative five. So that's five nines. Uh, it's a high fidelity. Uh, and the depth is, is uh, so we can reach that nice result, a depth of nine. Just to give you an idea of the size of the optimization problem, that's nine times five. So it's 45 unknown parameters being found to get to that one of these data points. Um, so that was nice and uh, relative, not that hard to solve. The hard part is this one. We tried to simulate that circuit. Uh, and this is known as the perfect error correcting uh, code. It was introduced a long time ago by Ray Laflamme and his colleagues. And it has like, and I, I'm not aware of any implementation of it because you can, you can see why. It has multiple multi-qubit gates involved. But it's efficient, that's why it's called perfect, because it only needs five qubits. Uh, so what, it, what we want to do is that we want to set, send an, so can any state here and add four ancillary qubits. At the other end, we get the logical qubit out uh, at the other end of that circuit. This is the encoding part, and the, the decoder is the same or similar. So what we did is that we just kept looking for a solution with high fidelity. You can see up to depth of 20, there was uh, nothing above 80%. So that's disappointing. But this just means that, you know, uh, we went from like see searches that took seconds to hours and we couldn't find a good, good solution. But then, so I'm gonna skip, go straight to depth of 25 instead of creating statistics for you. We just one, found one uh, data point, which is uh, close to one up to the machine precision. So up to the number of digits we keep in the simulation, we can get close to, the, to that circuit. So uh, our, uh, and so you might not care about this. I like to have experimental friends. This is the solution I would give to my experimental friend. This is the pulse sequence you can give to your uh, so pulse generator, and these are, each line is basically each panel is for one one of your atoms so then and the red and blue are the red and blue lasers basically you need to excite these red brick atoms um, the nice thing just one last thought is that um, we can directly instead of not not going to this abstract version of how error is going to so sort of propagate into system this is so for example uh, ken talked about one of their most important problems being on like fluctuation in laser intensity. We thought the same thing would be an issue. So we're allowing 1% error in the pulse area, which includes how well you time your pulse and how well you control the intensity. And uh, we looked how this sort of fidelity is gonna be affected by that. So this is just trying to, so we looked at these things and the, 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 these solutions that gives you really high fidelity they survive that type of error, which is nice. That's one thing we want to know. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I'd like to thank the students uh, um, and uh, involved in this. This was done by, if you believe me, an undergraduate student to begin the, the effort, and then uh, followed by a nice work by a P new PhD student in my group. That's on the Rydberg Adams side. And on the Rydberg Exiton side, this was a collaboration. Again, an undergraduate student in our group. PhD student with, um, in collaboration with a group of Christoph Simon in Calgary and uh, Valentin Walther, he's a postdoc at, at Harvard who calculates these Rydberg uh, coefficients uh, that, that really helps with these calculations. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.